Good evening and welcome to TVB News. Xia Baolong, director of the State Council's Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office, said the central government will provide the last line of defense to handle national security affairs that are beyond the capability of the SAR government. After listening to the top Beijing officials' speech, Chief Executive John Lee said he will fast-track the legislative work of the local security law, Article 23 of the Basic Law. Jacqueline reports. This morning, the Chinese Association of Hong Kong and Macau Studies held a seminar on the national security law at the Convention and Exhibition Center. In attendance were Chief Executive John Lee and the Director of Beijing's Liaison Office in Hong Kong, Luo Huining. The event live-streamed a speech from Xia Baolong, the Director of the State Council's Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office. He said the national security law is the guardian of human rights and freedoms, while leading Hong Kong out of the quagmire of political squabbles. Xia also highlighted the dual enforcement mechanism of the security law. Under it, Hong Kong takes up the main duty of safeguarding national security, while Beijing can step in to straighten out issues that the SAR could not resolve. He said the recent interpretation of the security law by Beijing on Articles 14 and 47 has helped lay out the method and path for solving problems in the SAR. After attending the seminar, Chief Executive John Lee threw his weight behind the security law on a social media post. He added he would turbocharge the legislative work of Article 23 of the Basic Law to prohibit acts such as treason against Beijing. Barrister and lawmaker Priscilla Leung added the SR government should proactively study which local ordinances could be amended to align with the national security law. If it relates to very serious cases or ambiguous situation, then Hong Kong courts, as well as in particular the National Security Committee, of Hong Kong SAR need to assert um, the true intent of the national security law in line with the central authority. She said local legislation to be scrutinized includes the Legal Practitioner's Ordinance, Public Order Ordinance and Crimes Ordinance. Jacqueline, TVB News. High-speed trains between Hong Kong and the mainland will resume service this Sunday. Today is the second day of ticket sales and there were much fewer buyers flocking to West Kowloon Station compared to yesterday. Up until 6 p.m., all tickets heading from the city to Futian and Guangzhou on Sunday have sold out. Ticket sales this morning were less frantic compared with yesterday, with a few dozen people lining up at the West Kowloon station. More ticket buyers began to show up in the afternoon. The estimated waiting time was about an hour. Among the several ways to purchase high-speed train tickets, ticket buyers can do so via the China Railway website 12306. But many still decided to go with the traditional way of getting tickets at counters with staff assistance. Like this girl, who has already been waiting for 20 minutes. I can't use the system very well, so I go here to buy them. I think this is very, a lot of things need to upload. This man also preferred to buy tickets in person, adding the purchasing process at the counters took half an hour. To save time, passengers can buy tickets at the cell service counters, but they will need their original home return permit as well as electronic payments readily available. <laughs> Things weren't that smooth yesterday when ticket sales opened for the first day. Many were disgruntled after they failed to receive an authentication of the China Railway website. The situation did not get any better at midnight, with many having stayed for several hours in order to solve verification issues so that they could purchase their trip back to Hong Kong online. But the MTRC insisted passengers could receive authentication with their Hong Kong phone number via 12306. Speaking on a radio program, MTR's transport director Jenny Young said passengers are encouraged to verify their identity using phone number instead of email. The city reported 8,260 COVID cases today. That's around 1,000 cases fewer than yesterday. Meanwhile, residents with a CT value above 35 on their PCR test results will no longer be classified as infected starting Monday. The measure was taken as the Hong Kong government attempts to align the city's threshold for identifying negative cases with that of the mainland. This has government health advisor David Ho noted that CT values which indicate the amount of virus carried by a patient are no longer transmissive if the number surpasses 30. 
A lower CT value indicates a higher viral load. Ho added that public hospitals have recently ceased to use CT values as a standard for being discharged from hospital and believes that the measure will not affect the healthcare system. The U.S. Congress has voted to block oil from the country's emergency stockpile from going to China pending approval from the Senate. The bill would prohibit the Energy Department from selling oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to China. Biden withdrew 180 million barrels from the Strategic Reserve last year in a bid to halt rising gasoline prices amid production cuts by OPEC and a ban on Russian oil imports following Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. The months-long sales brought the stockpile to its lowest level since the 1980s. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin urged individual American politicians to drop their Cold War mindset. Gabonese President Ali Bongo Ondimba met with Chinese Foreign Minister Qin Gang in Libreville, the Gabonese capital, on Thursday to discuss boosting bilateral ties. Qin conveyed President Xi Jinping's warm greetings to the Gabonese President, noting the China-Gabon relations jointly forged by leaders of older generations of the two countries have withstood the test of time and remained rock solid. Qin said China and Gabon firmly support each other on issues concerning the core interests and major concerns of the two countries. He added Beijing stands ready to work with Gabon to consolidate mutual strategic trust, deepen pragmatic cooperation and elevate China-Gabon comprehensive cooperative partnership to a higher level. The Gabonese president asked Qin to convey his cordial greetings to President Xi while extending gratitude to China for its all-round and firm support of Gabon's socio-economic development. U.S. President Joe Biden is facing increasing pressure for keeping classified documents after stepping down from his role as vice president during the Obama administration. Attorney General Merrick Garland has appointed a special counsel to investigate after documents with classified markings were found at Biden's home in Delaware and at an office in Washington. This report from NBC. Tonight, with growing questions over whether President Biden mishandled classified information, including the revelation of a third discovery of classified material, Attorney General Merrick Garland making a bombshell announcement that he's appointing a special counsel to investigate. The extraordinary circumstances here require the appointment of a special counsel for this matter. Garland naming Robert Hur, a former federal prosecutor and U.S. attorney, to see if laws were broken. Garland saying classified documents from the Obama administration were found by Biden attorneys in two locations, Mr. Biden's private office he used after he left the vice presidency and President Biden's home in Delaware. Today, the president saying classified material was in his personal library at home and his garage, a location seen briefly in this campaign video. Classified, classified material next to your Corvette. What were you thinking? As I said earlier this week, people, and by the way, my Corvette's in a locked garage, okay? So it's not like you're sitting out in the street. So the but anyway. It was in a locked garage. Yes, as well as my Corvette. Um, but as I said earlier this week, people know I take classified documents and classified material seriously. The attorney general has been under intense pressure from Republicans to appoint a special counsel after he named one to investigate former President Trump's handling of 100 classified documents seized during an FBI search of Mar-a-Lago. Back then, Mr. Biden blasted Mr. Trump for having classified material at his home. How that could possibly happen, how anyone could be that irresponsible. But just two months later and a week before the midterm election, Garland says the first batch of classified documents, what sources tell NBC News is less than a dozen, were found by Biden attorneys at Mr. Biden's private office at his Washington think tank. That office was not authorized for storage of classified documents. Garland saying the DOJ was notified after the documents were handed over. On November 14th, Garland appointed a U.S. attorney to review the matter. But then on December 20th, Biden attorneys notified the U.S. attorney they had discovered more classified documents, this time inside the president's Delaware garage. And just today, President Biden's attorney saying they made a third discovery, another classified document at his Delaware home. But the White House did not tell the public about any of this until just this week 
and only in response to media reports. Republicans Medicare calling election. it a cover-up. Um, prior to an election, you found a sitting president when he was vice president with top secret documents. Why did they not even tell America that that transpired? Tonight, the White House says it's confident the special counsel investigation will show the classified documents were inadvertently misplaced. Welcome back to TVB News. In the UK, more than 70,000 staff at 150 universities will strike for 18 days between February and March in disputes over pay, working conditions and pensions. There's also worker unrest in France, this time over an amendment to retirement age and pensions. Tracy Furness has more. In France, workers will have to stay on the job two years or longer in order to qualify for their pensions under the reform. Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne announced the new reform that the age of retirement would be pushed from 62 to 64 years old. From 2027, workers will have to make social security contributions for 43 years rather than 42 years in order to draw a full pension. This has caused unrest as workers have been protesting on the streets of Paris this week. The reform is partly related to President Macron's promises to bring the budget deficit within EU limits by the end of his presidency in 2027. The change could yield the government 17.7 billion euros in annual pension contributions by 2030. For 38-year-old Gulliam Conrad, who supervises emergency cleaning and repair work in Paris's underground sewers, says working until 64 will be tough. Currently, because of the hardship of their work, they can retire at 52, which under the new system will be 54. He said it is a profession exposed to danger. In sanitation work, there is risk of falling, and there is a pattern of musculoskeletal disorders from heavy lifting risks of contamination with all the viruses. It is a real problem and is one of the most dangerous professions. All unions have already announced a nationwide day of strikes and protests on January 19th in response to the proposed pension reforms. They have warned of more action if the government adopt the bill in Parliament. Tracy Furness, TVB News. Lisa Marie Presley, the only child of the late Elvis Presley, died Thursday after being hospitalized earlier in the day. The singer was 54. She suffered a cardiac arrest. Born in 1968 to Priscilla and Elvis Presley, she went on to become a singer-songwriter in her own right. She married musician Danny Keogh in 1988 and had two children. She famously married the King of Pop Michael Jackson and actor Nicolas Cage and more recently, music producer Michael Lockwood, the father of her twins. She was most recently seen at her father's mansion, Graceland, celebrating with fans what would have been his 88th birthday on January the 2nd. And this week, she was at the Golden Globes supporting the movie Elvis, the biopic of her father, which was nominated for three awards. Back locally, a three-day community event including a photo exhibition has been organized by a social impact storytelling platform, Hong Kong Shifts, from yesterday. Christy Khan was at the exhibition. Bamboo scaffolders, sailors, street cleaners, fishermen, and so on. We are not unfamiliar with these occupations. But how much do you know about these people, shift workers who have been working day and night to make Hong Kong a vibrant and better place to live? Hong Kong Shifts, a social impact storytelling platform, has organized a three-day photo exhibition to shed light on the city's unsung heroes, the shift workers. The exhibition features selected photos of 50 Hong Kongers who represent a cross-section of the types of people we may encounter in our daily lives. Each of the photos have a story behind them. One of the founders, Maxim van Hollenbeck, who moved to Hong Kong 14 years ago, said his inspiration of initiating the project was sparked by a security guard at the place where he lives. I came down my building one morning and I realized I had passed by my security guard for many years without really knowing much about her and I had 
uh, this idea together with uh, Cynthia to try and, and, and just get to know her better. Over the past three years, the duo visited different neighborhoods across the city to try to engage random strangers and initiate a casual chat with them. Again, this project is not about a specific individuals, it's about everyone. Our focus is to give shift workers the recognition they deserve. I also truly think that connecting with people around us are, is really important and is a very simple thing to do to increase your level of happiness generally. Despite multiple rejections they experienced when they started approaching strangers on the street, they never felt discouraged. On the contrary, they kept looking for people who are willing to talk to them and share their stories. Sylvia Jen, the co-founder of the platform, said every person that they have interviewed are all featured on the platform without any filtering or selection. This as she believes that everyone has a story to tell. Hong Kong Shifts is all about building bridges between different communities in Hong Kong. We want to use storytelling as a tool to build empathy and to bring different people together. So we would also use um, the platform to hopefully encourage people to just make these very small connections on a day-to-day -day basis with people all around us in our living and working communities um, and to also break down any stereotypes that we may have about people around us. Currently, Hong Kong Shifts has collaborated with some local NGOs and schools to share and tell more various types of stories. The two founders hope Hong Kong Shifts can continue to engage more parties in society to work on amplifying the message of social inclusion and community engagement. Christy Khan, TVB News. The Chinese university has joined hands with Science Park to further develop biotechnology that could alleviate health conditions, including colon cancer. Timothy Lee tells us more. The human gut is often considered as our second brain that houses a rich microbiome, essentially a community of microorganisms with some that benefit our health. Having hosted the 2023 Microbiome Summit earlier today, CUHK's Microbiota Ice Center and the Science and Technology Park announced several breakthroughs in the clinical application of gut microorganisms. They include the use of microorganisms that can predict life-threatening health conditions such as cancer and performance-enhancing probiotics. First of all, uh, it will generate novel non-invasive diagnostic biomarkers for various conditions. By detecting these microbial markers in stool, we may be able to predict with high precision your likelihood of developing colon cancer or its precursors, meaning polyps. Secondly, we are going to develop new generation probiotics. With new generation probiotics based on science driven by this new technology, we will be able to identify those specific bacteria that would help improve our, for example, athletic performance, our mood. Professor Chan also announced a revolutionary method of treatment that utilizes gut microorganisms from the stools of newborn babies. Uh, the newborn's poo uh, is the most healthy because it is uh, very, uh, it has a high diversity. It contains a whole spectrum of bacteria, including a lot of good bacteria. Therefore, if we can store up these poo poo, and then one day we may be able to use their healthy poo stored at the newborn stage and put it back to improve the health, treat various conditions, and even to help other people. To encourage further development, the team is working on establishing a so-called Noah's Ark facility in the Lok Machau Loop area to store gut microbiome biosamples for health treatment purposes in the future. The Chinese university team said it will continue to strive for more advances in microbiome technology to better facilitate treatments for colorectal cancer, autism and diabetes. The team added that Hong Kong will need to attract more talents and R&D companies if it wants to become a global microbiome tech hub. Timothy Lee, TVB News. And that's the news. Thanks for watching.